Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Thank you to the organizers and uh, thanks for everyone coming out for this session. So this will be a high level view about how to build a team, basically addressing each of the points that we'll be discussing throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> So the first thing I'll go over are the guidelines, including some of the updates that have come out recently, and then discuss the rationale for the urologist's role in the care of patients with advanced prostate cancer. And then lastly, develop a framework for multidisciplinary care for these patients. So uh, we've seen this before, but this is sort of the natural progression of patients with prostate cancer. Uh, fortunately, still the vast majority of uh, men are diagnosed with uh, local disease that is treated or surveilled, uh, but some will progress and many of, some of those will require androgen deprivation therapy. And then a select group of those men will progress to either castration resistant or metastatic disease. So the clinical states that we'll be discussing biochemical recurrence, those who've re received primary therapy and have PSA recurrence, those with metastatic hormone sensitive disease, so either de novo metastatic or received treatment in the past and then progressed to metastasis. Non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, those who have been on ADT likely for biochemical recurrence uh, and then with PSA elevation without radiographic evidence of disease. And then lastly, those with metastatic castration resistant disease. So I won't read through every one of the guidelines. Again, we'll, we'll be going through these in, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but those with biochemical recurrence, you should likely observe them or start on clinical trial. Uh, routine ADT should not be started in these patients. Uh, but in reference to one of the questions, we can uh, preferably use PSMA PET where available uh, for those with PSA recurrence after failure of local disease. For those with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, again, you want to assess disease, and here again, PSMA PET can be used. Um, in select patients, you can start combination therapy, otherwise start ADT or surgical castration. Uh, for the combination therapy, they can be chemotherapy with docetaxel or uh, oral therapies with abiraterone or darolutamide, and these are level one data. For non-metastatic castration-resistant disease, again, you want to uh, obtain serial PSA testing, assess for um, any metastatic disease via conventional imaging. And then the uh, therapies offered in this space include apalutamide, darolutamide, enzalutamide, um, and then, um, but should not offer systemic chemotherapy at this state. And then for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, several options uh, in the hormone, uh, immunological, chemotherapeutic, and uh, uh, PARP inhibitor space. Um, again, using conventional or PSMA PET imaging uh, at intervals of six to 12 months, uh, the patient should continue with uh, ADT if they have not had surgical castration. Uh, part of the decision making for therapy, there is no optimal sequence uh, that's for each patient, uh, but you should assess what they have been on before when uh, discussing the next steps. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, genetic testing and the role uh, in certain therapies uh, according to certain mutations. Um, the, one of the newer ones to consider in addition to the oral therapies and immunotherapy includes lutetium uh, 617. Uh, especially in patients with uh, progressive disease after chemotherapy. So here are some of the options. Uh, patients who've had docetaxel before can get cabazitaxel. Uh, you can have uh, PARP inhibitors for certain uh, germline mutations. Uh, Cipulus OT and minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic patients. Um, and then platinum-based chemotherapy is an option as well. So what is the urologist's role? And, and I've, I've given talks before, and, and uh, usually a medical oncologist is asked, why is a urologist even doing this? And so I'll give the rationale uh, for uh, our participation. 
So many of the patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer have encountered urologists, even if they didn't have surgery. Uh, if you perform the biopsy, uh, follow up with PSAs, or even deal with some of the complications of either surgery or uh, radiation. Uh, a lot of patients will express desire for continued follow-up with their physician. Um, because of the frequent visits, uh, a lot of times the, the urologist is viewed as part of their, their care team. Uh, and then we can also manage some of the complications that occur with advancing disease. And so some men will develop outlet obstruction, upper tract obstruction, hematuria, uh, radiation cystitis. A lot of these patients will come to you if you're part of a larger group. It can be an internal referral, particularly if you've been identified as the specialist for these advanced patients. Uh, you, the, the physician or the advanced, practice, uh, advanced practitioner can uh, survey charts. Um, if you have electronic medical record, you can uh, look up certain codes uh, to see if patients are uh, moving along in, in progression of disease. And then lastly, there are data analytics software where you can set parameters and basically track patients and you can identify, okay, this patient's had two PSA elevations in a row, or this patient is due for imaging, uh, or someone has evidence of metastatic disease. And so you can decide who needs to be initiated on androgen deprivation therapy, or if they need to go progress to advanced therapies or clinical trials. So the person who will be seeing uh, these patients within a urology clinic should have very strong familiarity with the clinical guidelines and new advances in therapy. And, and uh, you'll see at this meeting there, there are several things that are always in the pipeline. Uh, the uh, physician and APP can work together and, and serve as a resource for each other uh, and, and really uh, see patients uh, in multiple settings if necessary. The, uh, the APP can really be a, uh, a good resource for these patients, uh, can see those who are stable on therapy, um, can uh, follow the guidelines as far as when to get imaging, uh, when to get uh, bone density imaging, when to uh, follow up on um, <clears throat> skeletal health and um, um, uh, symptoms. And then you also want to have access to a specialty pharmacy. Uh, most of these medications are not readily available at your local drugstore, and so partnering with a specialty pharmacy does give you access to this. They can also discuss drug-drug interactions. Many of our patients are older and may be on blood thinners or, or uh, other medications uh, that can have uh, effects. They can also help communicate with uh, foundations uh, to get funding. Uh, and company-specific programs to lower cost. And this is important because uh, financial toxicity is a huge aspect of the therapies that we use. Uh, you can remember years ago when CIPT came out and the, the, you know, the number, you know, 250,000 or 100,000 uh, to get care. Uh, this is a paper that was uh, done by one of our fellows at Vanderbilt, um, Ruchika Talwar. And uh, she looked at the overall cost of multiple medications in the urologic sp space. And on the, the far right there, you can see abiraterone, uh, which is quite expensive. And she did a comparison with the uh, Mark Cuban uh, drug uh, cost saving uh, 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 program, which you may have seen in, in the media. And you can actually barely see the green line at the bottom for abiraterone there, but there, you can have a significant reduction of cost. Uh, through multiple pathways, including this one. So what should the urologist provide? We can certainly provide injectable or oral androgen deprivation. Uh, we should be comfortable with using the second line oral therapies uh, and understand the side effects that come with that and know where to send patients if that happens. Uh, we should be familiar with uh, Cipulucil T, immunotherapy. There are some groups that do give PARP inhibitors or docetaxel. I prefer to leave this to our medical oncology colleagues. This is a pretty unique set of uh, side effects and, and adverse events. And so uh, for the most part, that should be managed with um, uh, medical oncology. And then don't forget surgical castration. I, I do believe that some of the side effects that you see with ADT can be mitigated uh, with surgery. It's certainly much more cost effective uh, for patients who get a good response and remain undetectable. They don't have to visit as often. So don't forget about that. 
Now, as far as your internal team, obviously uh, the, the, the head of the team can really be your APP and, and lead nurse uh, because they can communicate with the patients and again, follow along with the stable patients. Uh, as I mentioned before, you do want to have your access to specialty pharmacy. You do want to have a tumor board, multidisciplinary tumor board uh, for complex patients. And again, that can help with decision making, particularly if you've gotten information from uh, genetic testing or, or imaging. You do want industry partners. Uh, they can help with clinical trials. Uh, they can help with cost savings. And a lot of times they're really re good resources for bringing in new data that may not be released yet or is, is hot off the press. And then you want to have access to apheresis and infusion units, particularly if you're using uh, Cipulus LT or PARP inhibitor. And then as far as your multidisciplinary team, uh, you do want to have a good relationship with your medical and radiation oncologist. You, you really should be working together with these patients. Uh, nuclear medicine, particularly for um, lutetium um, or radium therapy, uh, especially pharmacy, medical genetics. Uh, these, are, these are the people who can give us uh, or get, help us interpret some of the information that we get from germline testing or somatic testing. Um, apheresis location. And then uh, don't forget also palliative care and hospice. We, we beat these patients up pretty well, uh, especially once we start getting to some of the more advanced therapies. And you should really have a discussion early on with the patients. And th what I tell them is, we'll walk you through each step. I'll let you know of the options. But I'll also let you know when I think that the options that remain are going to significantly adversely impact your quality of life or maybe even shorten your life. And uh, just be honest with patients. They're gonna ask you, you know, how long do I have? What, am, what, are, my, what are my chances? And the, the, you can look at the trials and particularly in the placebo arm of trials and let people know this is the median survival. It's six months, it's 12 months, it's 27 months, whatever. Um, so that the patients understand. Um, and, and having palliative care uh, on your team uh, can really help assist with this as far as goals of care. Um, and, and palliative, again, is not necessarily end-of-life care, but really sort of management of quality of life. So just to summarize, uh, the patients uh, who have advanced prostate cancer have several options for therapy, and much of that can be managed by the urologist and APP. You do need to have multiple components to have a successful multidisciplinary clinic, and uh, I would encourage you to, to build out your team internally and externally. And again, don't forget clinical trials. The, these patients uh, deserve to have the highest level quality of care and the most advanced therapies. And so remember to use that when available. Thank you very much.